and uh, alhamdulillah alhamdulillah uh, we have reached the last uh, last leg of our journey in reviewing surah bani israil so inshallah inshallah today we will begin with ayah number 83 and inshallah our aim is that with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help we will complete the review of the surah today inshallah inshallah so amazing surah actually every ayah is like a gem and uh, you know you do feel like that about the quran with whichever ayah you are doing at that time whichever surah that you are reviewing it just kind of really dips you hard and uh, alhamdulillah that's the miracle of the quran so without further ado let's begin inshallah in alhamdulillah ya rabbi lakal hamdu hatta tarda wa lakal hamdu idha ma radit wa lakal hamdu ba'da rida wa lakal hamdu ala kulli hal allah اللهم لك الحمد حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه الحمد لله الذي انزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا الحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي آمين يا رب العالمين يا غفور الرحيم يا أرحم الراحمين يا ذا الجلال والإكرام فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم so alhamdulillah ayah number 82 was all about how the quran is a shifa for the believers and we talked about all the different aspects of shifa that allah subhanahu wa taala has given in the quran now right in the next ayah in ayah number 83 allah subhanahu wa taala is saying if we bestow the human being with a favor right you know allah subhanahu wa taala has bestowed us with so many ni'mas right wa idha an'amna 'ala al-insan 'arad wa wa na'a bi janibihi wa idha massahu sharr kana ya'usa yani when allah subhanahu wa taala gives us and bestows upon us favor upon favor all of these ni'mas that we have allah is saying he will ignore it as if it is not a favor and he becomes distant he turns to his side in pride and when harm touches him he would become extremely depressed this is a condition of a person that allah subhanahu wa taala is describing that he turns away right although as the previous ayah allah subhanahu wa taala has said the quran is a cure for for what lies inside the chest it has the power to heal right and one of the biggest diseases of the chest of our heart is what arrogance right because of this arrogance we just turn away from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we turn away from the shifa of the quran we turn away from the amazing benefits that this quran has for us and all of this when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bestowing ni'ma upon ni'ma upon us upon human being right allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually stating a fact a uh, a situation of a person who's not glued in whose heart is uh, heedless of the reality of allah subhanahu wa taala and of the benefits of the quran and in ayah number 84 allah subhanahu wa taala this is a beautiful ayah allah subhanahu wa taala is saying uh tell them ul o prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam tell them everyone works according to their predisposition Uh, we'll talk about this this word shakila qul kullun ya'malu ala shakilati fa rabbukum alamu biman huwa ahda sabila everyone works according to their own shakila and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows who is most guided in terms of path the one thing you should all share in common is your pursuit of guidance now what is this that allah is saying that everyone works according to their shakila let's try to understand this word shakila in a little bit of detail right what we learn from rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is shakila those of you who know um, urdu shakal right 
Shakal, we say in Urdu as well, our face, right? Shakal actually means form or shape, right? What is your shakal like? What kind of form do you have? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, each and every being will practice and conduct their affairs according to their own shakila, their own way, their own disposition, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best who is ahda sabila, yani who is uh, the most rightly guided, who has followed the most hidayah. So this shakila that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept in all of us, it's like human nature, it's got to do with our genes, it's got to do with our inclinations, our tendencies, our intellect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that all of our personalities, Allah has created them within a fence, right? Each and every human being. We are not clones of each other, right? And we are not meant to be clones of each other at all. We are not meant to be in one mold, right? There is diversity in us, right? We're talking about specifically about believers right now. There are certain capabilities that you have and certain limits that you have. And there are certain capabilities and limits that I have, right? Getting to know what your strengths, your capabilities, your uniqueness is, that, that your shakila is, that is an amazing thing for a human being to do. And that's the most important thing because everybody has to work within the limits. They cannot go beyond it. Some, some things you do very well. Some things you won't do very well. There's this very famous uh, uh, meme, right, which, which has been floating around for many years now, that you cannot judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree. So who is responsible to figure out each, everybody's chocolate? A, the individual themselves, right? You need to have that uh, wisdom. You need to have that insight. You need to make an effort to figure out what my strengths and weaknesses are. You know, when our children are uh, going to higher classes, et cetera, and they're choosing their certain subjects for say like either inter or O levels or A levels, et cetera, as parents, as responsible parents and as teachers, that's a responsibility of a teacher as well because parents are te and teachers are in kind of a leadership capacity, aren't they? So they kind of uh, steer the kids towards by looking at, okay, so, so somebody has an aptitude for say science. Somebody has an aptitude for uh, say finance, finance or accounts or math, et cetera. Somebody has a very artistic inclination. So that is something which is inborn. Hmm? Uh, I mean, I suck at math, for example, seriously. Uh, from grade four or five onwards, I could never help my children with math. It's, it's, it's just like that. It doesn't mean that I'm stupid. It's just that my mind doesn't work like that. Numbers I don't understand. I mean, you could have your strength. You need to figure that out. Because even if you look at it from a very dunya point of view, if we don't know where our strength lies, we just keep floundering all over the place. So like if you take the example of a kid, if you force a child who's not inclined towards, say, sciences, no, 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 you have to do chemistry. You have to do physics. You have to do, sometimes as mothers, we are like that, right? You are, and then they are miserable throughout those beautiful, young, you know, formative years of O-levels and A-levels, they're still very young, right? But you're insisting, no, you have to become a doctor. You have to become fella. He's just not getting it. She's just not getting it. She's miserable. They might work very hard and, you know, apply themselves and this tuition and that tuition and end up decent grades as well, maybe and even taking admission in a medical college. That's not the shakila. That is not something that goes down well with them. They're not in their tendency, their intellect is not geared towards that, right? So we really, really need to work really hard on discovering what our shakila is, right? What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has specifically favored you with. And you can serve your, your dunya as well as your deen with that shakila, right? That is very important because your nature is going to dominate and you can't, and you know, they say now you can't grow out of your skin. You can't get rid of your shakila. That's pretty much fixed. What you can do, right? What you can do, which is amazing is that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam was sent to us as the best uswa. This is another word. One is shakila, which is our inherent nature, etc. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ 
uswatun hasana yani allah has given us this absolute perfect role model this excellent pattern right to kind of of course we can uh, mold our shakila in and and make it better and go at a higher level which level are we supposed to aspire for this uswa this uswa right so this is within our capacity to look at the uswa and then work towards being like you know following the sunnah to the best of our ability but everybody's ability is different one of the amazing things about rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was that he recognized people's shakila and he kind of nurtured them that way if you look at rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam's companions both men and women right which included his azwaj mutahharat radhiyallahu ta'ala anhuma they were all different they were not all dolly right they were not all clones of each other everybody had a very distinct and different personality different tendencies and rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam nurtured that say for example aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala anha she was very cerebral she was very intellectual she was super smart and half of her being has come through her because the teacher her husband rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam recognized that and he nurtured that in her and he taught her and he sort of she explored all of those intellectual avenues because she had the opportunity to do that right look at uh, uh, say for example the four uh, khulafa rashidin all of them had distinct shakilas umar abu bakr usman ali radhiyallahu ta'ala anhum all very different amazing sahaba very different ali known for his shujaa for his bravery for his fighting skills right usman had this haya deep seated sense of haya in him right umar absolute justice and it's not that the others didn't have those qualities as well but those were predominant in them right uh, abu bakr his strength of character his deep 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 iman right all everybody is born different and if we see the sahaba rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in their tarish that for example there was a sahabi his name is hassan bin sabit radiyallahu ta'ala anhu he was a poet he was a poet right and rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam actually said about him that his poetry or his ayats like you know uh, uh, his poetry and his verses are like uh, uh, arrows that pinch a kuffar because he would defend rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam with his writing imagine and hasan bin sabit radiyallahu ta'ala anhu is that uh, 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 companion who actually didn't fight because he just said that i can't and that was perfectly all right nobody called him an enemy nobody said that you have to do it right hey right. and then we see that some of amazing generals like for example khalid, khalid ibn walid radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu everybody was not a fighter and everybody was not a a mufassir everybody didn't have the capacity or the capability or the time to be a scholar there were scholars scholar sahabas right ibn mas'ud radhiyallahu ta'ala an for example ibn abbas radhiyallahu ta'ala an for example but we, we see even amazing sahaba like umar or abu bakar were not scholars right and you know there's so many is our some had phenomenal memories like abu huraira and anas radhiyallahu ta'ala anhum their memories were more exceptional than everybody else is around them right so for some reason we feel that there is a stereotype of a believer there isn't there isn't everybody is born with strengths and with weaknesses and that is from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right and the mark of a good leader whether that leader is a parent whether that leader is a teacher whether that le- leader is a boss in an organization in whichever capacity is to realize the shakila of those who are with him those who are under him and then nurture that learning a lesson from rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam right and this is particularly very important for teachers because you know the future of a child the future of a, a young muslim is in your hands actually because if you if you guide them in the right direction according to their shakila 
then you're going to see them shining. It, it, is, it has happened also. I'm sure you must have heard stories from friends or whatever that a kid was doing certain subjects which she or he was really not inclined towards and working there like, you know, very, very hard. And then when they were actually allowed to drop that and take something, say, English literature or whatever, which sometimes parents think aren't any things to do. And then they really flourished. And then they really bloomed. And they really found themselves. Right? These days, when, when you talk about productivity, there's so many productivity gurus. People talk about self de develop, uh, uh, personal development so much, which is a great thing. The first thing is what? Find your strengths. Find your weaknesses. And finding your weaknesses is as important as finding your strengths. Right? Because you know what your limits are. You know what you can't do. That's also a great revelation, actually. Oh, no, I can't. Right? And another important thing is, that for a believer to say that I can't get up for Fajr, that is not an excuse. You can't cut it. Oh, it's not my shakila. I'm not a morning person. If that was the case, then Fajr would not be found on all believers. It wouldn't be found. Okay. So let's have that clear as well. That bit of it. So we, the deen of Islam is all for personal development, is all for diversity, is all for we need a team of people who bring in their different strengths. And that is when the team actually flourishes and is most productive. Everybody can't be the same. You have to have, even for a, to run, for a household to run, you have to have people with different talents, with different capabilities, with different skills. And when they get together and work towards this, an aim or, or say a project or whatever, then Alhamdulillah, you see what amazing results come in front. There are certain external factors that negatively affect our shakila. You know, one thing is that it is like, you know, our, your genes of your human nature is pretty much fixed, right? You are working it, steering it towards that uswa of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, absolutely. But there are factors which are outside factors, external factors that make your shakila unproductive and particularly unproductive for the akhira. Particularly, because you see, for a believer, Work is not just for this dunya. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana tam waqina azabana. Right? The prayer of the Prophet ﷺ, which he did most frequently, that give me hasana uh, in this dunya and give me hasana in the akhira. Right? So it's both and more focus on the akhira for a true believer. Right? So what are those factors? What scholars tell us is that first thing that is kind of, you know, not positive in terms of the effect that, that it has on our, uh, on our shakila is non-beneficial knowledge. Rasulullah hmm? wasallam prayed for beneficial knowledge and sought refuge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from non-beneficial knowledge. Allahumma inni a'uzu bika min ilmin la yanfa'u that ilm that does not bring me any benefit. Yeah? What could that be? That ilm that doesn't bring you benefit in this dunya or the akhira, both, right? Say, for example, uh, the ilm of uh, magic, that is absolutely 100% haram, right? Or there are so many other things when you get after, inshallah, when we come to this ayah which deals with the ruh, the ayah right next to it, when you get after the mutashabihat of the Quran, when you get after information which is most non beneficial for you because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not revealed it to you completely and you just want to know about that thing, that's problematic. That's non beneficial knowledge because you are steering yourself away from a practical uh, mindset and going into very gray areas. If Allah has not revealed it, that means it has no bearing on your hidayah, right? So non-beneficial knowledge. And the other thing is bad company. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has talked a lot about what kind of company do you keep, right? Al-mar'u ala deeni khalili, he said. A person is on the deen of his friend, right? So see who your friends are, what your environment is, where you are, because that has a direct effect, outside uh, effect on your shakila. And if it is all over the place, then that can have a very negative effect. That's such a beautiful ayat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that everybody is going to do amal according to their shafila. And your rub knows who's going to be 
rightly guided and who's on more guidance. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq and the ability to figure out our shakla no matter how old you are. Sometimes we figure ourselves out much later on in life. Everybody doesn't exactly know uh, about themselves or their strengths and weaknesses when they are much younger. The younger you found, find out, the better it is. But in case we've never had the opportunity to do that, may Allah give us the opportunity to do that right now. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability and the hikmah to to allow our children to figure that out and to assist them and to facilitate them, our children, our students, people who are uh, under our influence, to find out what their shakila is right? and use it to the best of their ability for the benefit of the deen of Islam. Right? Ameen, Ya Rabbal Alameen. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيَسْ أَلُونَكَ أَنِ الرُّوحُ قُلِ الرُّوحُ مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّي they asked you, O Prophet وسلم, about the ruh. They ask you about the ruh. Sometimes uh, what scholars say is that even this translation that you have in front of you, it's translated as soul, but it's best to translate it as ruh or perhaps spirit. Why? Because nafs sometimes is called soul as well, and then you shouldn't get confused with nafs and ruh. Ruh is from the commandment of my master, right? Ul, yani say, a ruh in amri rabbi, it's from the amr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, um, and you haven't been given out of knowledge except a little. Yani you've been given a little knowledge about it, right? So the unbelievers are going to ask you, O Prophet, وسلم, especially this is Ahle Kitab and specifically the Yehud. They're going to ask you concerning the Ruh. Now, like I just said, sometimes Ruh is translated as soul, sometimes as spirit. But you need to be a little careful to differentiate between soul as nafs or soul as Ruh. So say Ruh is from the Amr of my Rab, right? This word Amr over here. So what does Amr mean? Amr here has predominantly two meanings. One, it is from the command of my Rob, right? And two, Amr means it's the affair of my Rob. And both are very, very deeply linked. It falls under the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It has been created from the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the knowledge of it, one of the affairs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of this meaning is here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the ruh with his kalmai kun fayakun from his command, as opposed to our body, which is created through conception, gestation, stages of fetal development, infant, de uh, infant development, etc. The ruh was created instantaneous, direct, without any sabab, from the amr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah is saying, but you have been granted only a little knowledge. Yeah, very simple. It's not that complicated. And non-beneficial knowledge would be what? that you are absolutely, completely hell-bent on getting after what exactly is this. The ruh is from the world of al-amr. The body and physical being is from the world of al-khalq. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran has called Jibreel alayhi salam, the Quran itself, and what is inside of us as ruh. All of these three things have been called ruh. So all of us are essentially organic matter, and the mystery of our uniqueness and the difference in creation comes from this thing called a ruh. Right? The biggest mystery in psychology is personality. The biggest mystery in personality is the ruh itself. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses it. It's not as if he doesn't address it in, in the Quran, but Allah is saying that you have been given little knowledge about it. Let's understand what qaleel means, right? It's a whole subject actually, but just to understand it briefly, people may have different understandings of it. But the most important thing here is to note that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran has done two nafi, two negations. First, he has negated that we know everything about the ruh, right? But he's also negating that possibility that we don't know anything about the ruh. We know a little bit. It's not as if we don't know anything. So Khalil is a relative term, isn't it? If 
we use it in regard to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows about the ruh and what we know. Even if it is a lot, it is nothing compared to the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we compare it to other things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us about, then we know little about the ruh, right? So one thing to understand. Now, the revelation of this was that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud ta'ala an says, once he was walking with the Prophet wasallam, when a group of Jews passed by and they kept telling one another to ask Rasulullah about the ruh. And when they sat down, and then they sat down and they discussed whether they should ask which one of them should ask, should ask it. All this was happening within earshot of the Prophet. Finally, they asked. When they first asked, Rasulullah remained silent. When he remained silent, then this revelation came down to him. Right? So this yes alunaka is that the Jews had prompted the question. Right? If you look at different ayat of the Quran and different ahadiths, there are quite a few things that we do know about the ruh. For example, this notion of alam e arwah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created all the ruhs of all of humanity right at the time of Adam alayhi salam. And we also know, right? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gathered all of us. We don't remember that, but it is in the Quran in Surah Al-Araf that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gathered all the arwah, all the, all the, uh, spirits of all humanity and ask them and address them with a question, Am I not your Lord? And we all replied, Yes, we absolutely bear witness that yes, you are our Rabb. We also know that the ruh is infused into the fetus at, fetus at around 120 days. We know about that. So there are little, little things that we do know. We also know that the ruh has a heart which is our spiritual heart known as the pulp. So there is information, but you cannot call it the entire reality. And what ulama and scholars tell us is that there is a reason for that. What is the reason? Ruh is that part of you and me which receives signals from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our body as such does not receive hidayah. My arm or your arm or our brains, which, with our, which are like sponges, they don't re receive hidayah. Where does hidayah come? Your qalb. Your qalb. May yu'minu billahi yahdi qalbah. Qalbahu. The person who has iman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends hidayah where? On his qalb. The, the wahi used to come on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's qalb. Right? All of the spiritual things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends, whether it is his hidayah, whether it is his rahmah, whether it is his tawfiq to do some amal, whether it is the tawfiq to feel some taqwa, all of the ways in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala relates to you and me is with our ruh. So for that reason, we don't know everything about it because we don't know everything about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Nor, nor do we know exactly how he relates to a person, what the mechanism is, right? And how he inspires a person with fear or how he inspires a person with his jalal or his jamal. We don't know that in its entirety. So this the ruh is that wondrous part of us because it is that part which is engaged with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And for a true believer who wants beneficial knowledge, he would leave it at that. Right? He would leave it at that. And for somebody who wants to have like, an, you know, people who have this argumentative nature or people who say, oh, I'm an agnostic or whatever, these are the things that they get after. And they want you to reply to it. But but, but what about the ruh? Look at the entire Quran. Look at the entire teachings of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you want absolute 100% clarity on one thing, which is from the Mutashabihat. That is the difference between the mindset and the... Uh, approach of a true believer and somebody who's a little dodgy all over the place. Then immediately after this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 86, if we were to wish, we could take that every single thing that we have revealed to you, O Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Such a scary thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, 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 is addressing his beloved Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam like this. And after that, you will never be able to find any wakil, any guardian, any helper against us. Allahu Akbar. This is Allah talking to Rasulullah, who he loves, 
who he sends wahi upon who he has sent as rahmatul alamin who has who he has bestowed the final and last message the quran on right so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying after this illa rahmatan mir rabbik inna fadlahu kana alayka kabira this hasn't happened but for the mercy of your rabb and indeed the fadl of your rabb the bounty the grace upon you o prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is kabir alayka kabira is tremendously immense according to one scholar the translation is this ayat these ayat is basically allah is allah and nabi is nabi right allah subhanahu wa taala is allah subhanahu wa taala right so allah subhanahu wa taala is basically saying over here what right that this ilm that allah has given you is only from allah subhanahu wa taala it is allah subhanahu wa taala's rahma and if he takes it away from you then what are you going to do so even last time we mentioned that that when allah subhanahu wa taala talks like this in the quran addressing rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he is addressing you and me right no one is preserving the quran in your chest only allah subhanahu wa taala no one will be able to uh, preserve it right it's a great favor of allah subhanahu wa taala and then allah says in ayah number 88 tell them all tell them o prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam if all the human beings and all of the jinns work together you know that they would come forward with uh, or bring or produce the likes of this quran they will not be able to do it even if some of them were able to uh, be backups for each other they would collaborate with each other as best as they could they just will not be able to do it if all of humanity and all of jinn got together and they combine and they conspire and they collaborate they will not be able to bring the likeness of the quran they just will not be able to do that but this alim has come in the quran many many times it come in surah baqarah in surah yunus in surah hud now in surah bani israil and in surah tur all of so many times like 1 2 3 4 5, at least 5 times it has come in the quran right um today what people say about the quran what that is redundant obsolete right medieval right uh, just like scientific theories are proven wrong because of advancement in science or something like that they don't understand that this is actually the kalam of allah subhanahu wa taala what does that mean allah subhanahu wa taala is not dependent his ilm is not dependent on inference or experiment or observation not at all his ilm is complete his ilm is all encompassing right the entire creation all of the creation is actually a fail of allah subhanahu is actually an action of allah subhanahu wa taala right? and then there are so many different chemical and physical laws which are upholding creation as we know it yeah which have been changed they are constant they are absolutely constant from the time of creation till today right gravity speed of light uh, water displacement for example right they are all constant you know they they've, they've been going on and on and on and on and they work just fine right alhamdulillah so the rub who made these physical laws right what is the reason that he wouldn't make laws for humanity which is the quran which are going to be constant right they will never be obsolete it really doesn't matter what time and space and geographical area what century you are in there are certain constants in the quran and they will always be like that moral laws of allah subhanahu wa taala will always be constant it really doesn't matter which century you are living in right so this is just not talking about the words of allah subhanahu wa taala that you bring a quran like this it's talking about the systems that allah has created can you bring a system like that a system of justice that is in the quran right all of these moral laws that are in the quran can you bring it no you can't no you can't now you see certain things are flexible and certain things change with time say for example business laws right system of government allah subhanahu wa taala has given hudood and parameters for certain things right as long as, long as you stay within those parameters alhamdulillah you can have your own systems working 
but certain things are absolute constants and as human beings we understand and appreciate that really for example gender relations relationship between husband and wife that's a constant you can't bend it there is no gender bender situation that's constant allah has either created you a man or created you a woman and there are certain people who are somewhere in between and that, that that's about it what you see today is that everything goes that you are trying to change and twist around a constant and which is just not going to bring you any benefit either in this dunya and most certainly not in the hereafter but that benefit even in this dunya is not going to be there for you if you go after stuff like that right what is haram and what is halal is a constant alcohol is haram period that's it it, it it's going to say haram right backbiting is absolutely haram is going to stay like that that's a constant moral laws moral values that allah subhanahu wa taala has given us relationship you know interpersonal interactions that allah subhanahu wa taala has given us they are all constants nobody can change if you try to change it then you're going to put yourself in a hole and we see that happening around us right so this challenge is not just a uh, limited to words of the quran right and uh, today perhaps the words might not impress people that much but if you objectively if you with fairness look at what the quran is offering even to the non believer then you will have to logically say that this is one of the best systems that human being can have to live an amazing life in this dunya and inshallah inshallah hope for the mercy of allah subhanahu wa taala in the akhirah so this this challenge has been there since the time of rasul allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam right then allah subhanahu wa taala says and this is allah subhanahu wa taala's amazing mercy on us, on us that indeed for all humanity right annas this is not only for uh, believers for all humanity for all people Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has explained every type of subject matter, every issue in the Quran in multiple ways. However, most people have chosen not to accept it. That is the tragedy of humanity, right? فَأَبَى أَكْثَرُ النَّاسِ إِلَّا كُفُورَ كُفُورَ Most people, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is actually saying this is an eternal rule, and this is not going to change. the vast majority of people on earth will always not believe in the quran unfortunately it was true at the time of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and it has been true every day since then muslims are what um, 1.2 billion out of how many say 6 billion or whatever the majority is not muslim and the majority was never muslim and the majority will never be muslim right so allah subhanahu wa taala has presented every issue every uh, uh, situation that we can face in various different ways with all kinds of example but people are just bent upon disbelief they refuse any other alternative but disbelief and the sad part is you know as human beings we want to try things out right we want to experiment we want to try things out we never want to try the system of islam and we reject it without trying you try it out it doesn't work so reject it but we don't even try it out that is the unfortunate thing right then allah subhanahu wa taala now in uh, verses 90 to 94 is going to give like a case study of how they are so so stuck in this belief right wa qalu lan nu'mina laka hatta tafjura lana min al ardi yanbu'a right they are they said <coughs> they will say we will not accept lan nu'minu lak we will never ever accept what you are saying you know this is what rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is saying until you spring out for us explode from the earth for us this is a spring of water right uh, this word yang bu a uh, it's like a spring of water from the ground that's bubbling out right crazy bubbling spring of water so what are the we will never ever believe in you we want miracles on demand and that's the same thing you see in the atheists today they run around with three objections to the quran say say for example something about the roof that's it they don't see anything beyond that right 
And okay, you say, okay, look at the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at this, look at that. You know, contemplate on the systems, you contemplate on creation, etc. They're like, no. If you convince me about this, whatever that issue is, keep the rest of the Quran on your head. I don't care. This is going all the way back to the Jahili Arabs. That's exactly what they said to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's a very strange way of talking, huh? Lannu minalak. We will not believe in you until. These are the same words and the same manner of speech that the kuffar use. Right? Same manner of speech which we hear today that the kuffar use. So, the, for, so, so for the young man and the young woman, you should realize this. Don't get so shaken up by that one little atheist professor that goes and believes, um, you know, you get a BA and MA in philosophy from a two-bit university somewhere, right? They don't even know how to engage with you properly and they mock you and tease you about your belief of, and about the Quran. Look, can you explain this to me? Can you answer this to me? You know, they're going to come up and your iman gets shaken up because somebody asked you a question. Understand on this side, you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and everything he said in the Quran. And on that side is this one person asking you this one question. Right? We have to relate these ayat to our own lives, to our own selves. Don't get shaken up by statements like that. Right? Even if you're not a young man or a young woman and you face somebody's agnosticism or somebody's atheism or somebody's skepticism. And then you're saying, or maybe you should own a garden that should be in your possession made of palm trees and grapes and make rivers burst out. Right? You know, tafjira, a huge bursting river somewhere. Or what else are they saying? They're saying, or maybe you should drop on top of us the sky as you would assume to see fit, as you would assume to see fit piece by piece. Yani because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has talked, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling him about, about Qiyamah, right? That what's going to happen? That the sky is going to be like absolutely rendered, shattered, right? And bits are going to be flying around. So why don't you do that right now? And then look at the insolence, right? Oh, or how about you bring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the angels face to face? Allah, right? Face to face. Just, just bring it on, you know, is what they're saying. So full. Yeah, no, sorry. In 93, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, or they're saying, or you have a house made of gold, or you ascend to the sky, and we will not believe in your ascension. You know, what some scholars say is that this is kind of a hint uh, of the mi'raj of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, unless you send down to us a book that we may read. That, that we may read. You know, these, again, these miracles on demand. So what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying? Pull. You sh what, what should you say in response, right? O Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Subhana Rabbi. My Rabb is way above and beyond these petty demands that you are asking for. Great and glorious is my Rabb over any and all of this that you are asking. And who am I? Hal kuntu illa bashar al rasula. And I am anything other Am I anything other than a human and a messenger? I'm not claiming that I can build a house of gold or ascend up to the sky on my own, right? Their demands are absurd. This is the history of the Quraysh and their demands. And then they would say he's a magician or a soothsayer, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in several places in the Quran, you just have to deliver. mubin. You deliver. You just have to make the message reach them. You are not responsible for answering their questions. If that's true for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa what kind of questions? These kind of non-beneficial getting after mutashabihat questions, right? If that's true for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's true for every one of us today. You are not responsible. You are not liable to answer every single question of every atheist, agnostic, cynic, and skeptic. We simply put the Quran and the message in front of them. After that, Hidayah is at the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, and what forbade the people that they should come to believe when guidance comes to them? That they would keep saying, the human messenger is coming to guide us, right? 
قالوا ابعث الله بشرا رسولا so when rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam says i'm just a human they'll tear and turn around and say then why should we follow you right allah says this is a main reason that kept people following the messengers the main problem is human beings following authority they don't want to be enslaved they don't want to feel like i'm following somebody yeah because i am so much better that is the arrogance of the kuffar if you are human then we are better refusing to accept today what is happening the thing is aql and science you bring them quran it means nothing just words they think their words and their science that superior without realizing the science is from allah subhanahu wa taala actually right <laughs> they are the master philosopher they are the erudite eloquent person they cannot appreciate the eloquence and veracity of the quran because they are too focused on themselves on their own eloquence their own words their own ilm their own intelligence their own knowledge so ilm of deen means nothing all that means is their own degrees from any fancy fancy university that's one of the biggest problems that we have today right tell them allah subhanahu wa taala say qul tell them oh my beloved prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had the earth been filled with angels walking around casually then we would have sent them an angel from the sky as a messenger i mean please is that rocket science Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a human messenger because we are human. If he had sent an angel, they would, they would have said, oh, well, yeah, he's an angel. How can I follow an angel? This is why Islam, in Islam, the Sahaba, for example, are superheroes, but not to the extent that they are superhuman. The great things they accomplished are not impossible for other people. That's an amazing thing, right? that's absolutely amazing and look at how desperate we are for heroes all of these different superhero universes in movies and all that we see because we have lost track of where to go who to follow who's our influencer who should i look up to and we definitely need to do that because it's human nature to follow that's how we are created we have to have a leader right then allah subhanahu wa taala goes on to say in ayah number 96 <clears throat> say o prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam tell them allah subhanahu wa taala is enough as a witness between me and yourself no doubt he has been specially when it comes to his slaves an owner of full knowledge and full view and you know qul allah subhanahu wa taala uses this for the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam qul sometimes means saying your heart perhaps verbally saying to them may not have any benefit say in your heart meaning say to yourself that no very clearly that kafa billahi shahida baini wa bainakum innahu kana bi ibadihi khabiran basira right so this is true for you and me as well know very well in your heart that that is the case yeah then allah subhanahu wa taala says whoever allah subhanahu wa taala were to guide then he will be the one with guidance and whoever he misleads won't find any protective protective friends other than him we are going to raise them on the day of resurrection on their faces blind mute deaf their final place to go back to is jahannam every time it starts dying down yani when the fire starts kind of smoldering and dying down we increase we increase them in terms of the burning and scorching allahumma ajirni min an-nar allahumma ajirni min an-nar allahumma ajirni min an-nar right and what scholars tell us is that this summum bukmun umyun umyan wa bukman wa summan this is like a physical state of the disbelievers on the day of judgment right because when allah subhanahu wa taala talks about a living person with summum bukmun umyun issue that is metaphorical right but what scholars tell us is that in ayat like this like in this ayat this is a physical state can you imagine being blind and mute and deaf and then burning and then not knowing what's going on around you what a scary and awful and horrific place to be may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that zalika jazaa'uhum bi annahum kafaru bi ayatina that is their com- uh, compensation their jaza because they had disbelieved in our ayat in our miraculous signs right 
the signs that are in the Quran and there are signs that are all around us in the universe, right? All inside of our bodies as well and outside. All, all these are all signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of these ayats of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they had said, when we have been reduced to dirt and decay, are we really going to be raised a new creation all over again? I mean, seriously, this question, which you hear skeptics and agnostics say even today, is what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created, even if we just look at our own bodies, say for example, such sophisticated systems Allah has created in our body. Even if you look at one thing, say our respiratory system, right? Or uh, our, our digestive system. Any, I mean, our body itself is so sophisticated. The mechanism is so precise. One little thing goes here and there and we are unwell. You, you know, your sugar is going high, your blood pressure is going here, you know, there's one little thing happening here and there. It's not huge, right? And it kind of, every the equilibrium, the balance gets disturbed. Who can create that? Who can create that? But all of the advancement of science today, right? And all of that knowledge is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by the way. So he chooses to reveal knowledge periods of time, right? As, as progress happens, what we call progress, that's not man-made, Allah gives human beings tawfiq to discover, right? Even with all of the sophistication, no one has been able to and no one will be able to absolutely 100% create a body as beautifully balanced as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. So when he can do that over and over and over again, right? So what, what is the problem with putting all the minerals and the and all of the... Uh, material of creation together again how is that i mean that doesn't even make logical sense to say that once we are reduced to bones and da, 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 how will we be raised again that's actually quite a stupid question if you think of it you don't have to be super intelligent to figure that one out right it's a very basic thing even a child can figure out really so when you when you're hell-bent in disbelief you become quite soft in the head really in a lot of ways in a lot of ways, right? Don't get uh, impressed by big words and big ideas because sometimes, like, you know, these atheists are walking around strutting, one should say. Use these fancy fancy uh, uh, terminologies and all. Don't get impressed by that. At the bottom of it, it's just very old jahala, very old ignorance. And that is the reason we need to be sticking to the Quran because only then we realize, okay, so this is what is going on, but I am getting on the back foot about my own Iman because somebody is using big words. Yeah, don't, don't, don't get <laughs> stumped by vocabulary. Yeah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, haven't they seen that Allah is the one who created the skies and the earth? is capable, capable of creating the likes of them and he made a deadline for them in which there is no doubt whatsoever. They refuse anything at being with disbelievers. Yani, they, there are many, many options, right? We could have talked about Shakila. All believers are not, in, you know, are definitely not the same. And there are many options to operate within. Many options. But what they choose out of all of that is outside of the box. They think it's outside the box and that is disbelief. Yeah. The ayat of the Quran are an invitation to look at the ayat of creation. Look outside of yourself. Each and every creation of God is a miracle in itself. So what are the miracle are you asking for? What are the miracle are you asking for? Right? All of these ayat of Allah are not confined to the Quran at all. Any thinking person, any person who contemplates, any per person who has some chops to really flex, looks at the sun or the moon or the bird or you know just that little plant growing in your garden, that's a miracle in itself. It's a miracle in itself if only they see if only they understand, if only their hearts are open to possibilities, right? When this, what disbelief actually does is that it locks our hearts completely. It puts it, it shuts our hearts to any other possibility but disbelief, right? Do, if you don't come to the Quran immediately, look around you and figure out how's, how's all this happening. They call it nature. Yeah. They have all these fantastic shows 
that they show quote unquote nature. What is nature? It's God. That's what it is. That's that's really what it is. It's just that disconnect that you don't want to say the G word, right? So to speak. Allah is saying constantly in the Quran, "Awalam yarau an Allah, an Allah aladhi khalaq al samawati wal ard." Have you not seen who has created the heavens and the earth, right? So this challenge, this uh, sometimes it comes as a challenge, and sometimes Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is just nudging us towards this, right? Just have a look, just see, just con contemplate, you know. But you know. When you lose your sense of wonder, right, and you just one part of your mind and your heart, more your heart than your mind, is completely locked up. And what do you do? How do you reach out? Yeah. Then Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says in ayah number hundred, uh, "Say, O Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, tell them in res in response to all your requests, if you in fact own the treasures of the mercy of my Master." You would have stopped spending out of fear that you will have to spend it and it will run out. And the human being is incredibly greedy, extreme, extremely stingy, right? Wakanal insana patura, niggardly, right? Stingy, doesn't want to let go. And this is such a such a reality that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is saying, right? That our hearts are so constricted. And our fists are so closed that we don't want to share. So if, say for example, Allah had given his mercy, hmm? we would not give it to anybody else. We would just keep it for ourselves. That is the situation of the human being. That is the situation of a disbeliever. What scholars tell us is that what, what should you and I make of this ayah? We should pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it never comes true for us. Be merciful and compassionate at every opportunity we get. That is a lesson for us in ayat like this. Please do understand, whatever ayat that we go through in the Quran has a direct bearing on you and me and our amal, right? And the possibilities of our, uh, what choices we make. It has a direct bearing on that. And if we are making our choices with keeping the ayat of the Quran in front of us and the ayat of the afaq in front of us, then alhamdulillah, half our battle is won with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. So right over here, when Allah is talking about that man is so niggardly and so tight-fisted, that we should pray to Allah, Ya Rabbi, make me ghani, make me, uh, make my heart compassionate towards people, make me merciful towards people, right? And towards animals, and towards the environment, right? Particularly towards people, no matter what they've done to us. No matter how you feel that you've been wronged by the person who works in your home, right? Whatever, every opportunity we get, we should say, shukar, alhamdulillah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me a little bit of that raham that he has. He's ar rahman ar rahim right? And one little tiny part of it he's given to human beings. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all be from those who use that raham the way he likes it. And Allah says in ayah number 101, and we certainly had already given Musa salam, miraculous signs. Then go ask the sons of Israel when Musa salam, came to them and Fir'aun said to him, I'm pretty sure Musa that you are a victim of magic. Mashura, victim of magic. Now this is very interesting. Because you see, he used to call Musa salam, a jadugar, right? A sahir. Sahir is somebody who is a magician. Right? That's a very aggressive way. That's an attack on somebody if you say that you are a sahir, like they would say about Rasulullah. And then there's another way, right? You say, Oh Musa, you are mashoor, you're a victim, right? You're a victim of magic. Isn't that amazing? Sometimes when you are learning deen and when you start following the Sunnah of Rasulullah, you want to become a practicing Muslim. Then people say, What to you? You're mashoor. You've been brainwashed, right? You're a victim. Don't don't go to such and such class. Don't go and sit with so and so because they're really doing something. Something is happening to you. Oh, you know that kind of situation, right? So this is incredible. And this kind of this kind of 
false sympathy that sometimes puts you in self doubt oh perhaps i am not doing the right thing am i going a little crazy am i becoming an extremist right you have become a sport so allah subhanahu wa taala is constantly reminding us in the quran la raiba fi there is absolutely no doubt in this so these both of these extremes if somebody is calling you like oh aggressively that you are the magician or somebody is calling you the victim to the, the, the both are dangerous for our iman for our yaqeen for our uh, stability in deen right so what 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 should you and i do in a situation like that to save ourselves from both these dangers have absolute 100% yaqeen that there is nobody who is more uh, merciful than allah subhanahu wa taala nobody who has my back more than allah subhanahu wa taala and rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and nobody who cares about my future more than allah subhanahu wa taala and rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that's it yeah and be absolutely firm in being attached to the quran and to the sunnah right because you know na the rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that, that i'm leaving behind you two things if you hold on to them then you will never go astray one is the quran and the other is my sunnah then in ayah number 102 allah subhanahu wa taala says uh he said yani musa alaihi salam said who is this he qala musa alaihi salam you already know that nobody sends these miraculous signs down except the masters of the heavens and earth and i see firon that the path you've taken you're as good as dead yeah you're as good as dead so musa alaihi salam is very very clearly saying very very clearly saying what with full confidence that you look at yourself don't be my don't try to be my savior save yourself like in urdu we say na apni khair manao right he's he's being very confident uh, in his belief and in his saying uh, why are you trying to be like my mother hen right look after yourself because this is not true uh, sympathy or empathy at all right so uh, what scholar says it like an injury that gets infected you are as good as dead when a person sees hell from a distance he says sabur masbura right so this is that kind of situation that allah subhanahu wa taala says in ayah number 103 firon wanted to make bani israil and musa alaihi salam slip from the land so we drowned him and whoever was with him all together they tried to harass them they tried to drive them out of the land and what was the end result allah subhanahu wa taala's wrath allah subhanahu wa taala's wrath right allah subhanahu wa taala is absolutely telling us that this is the end of the disbeliever this is the end of the one who gets after and tortures and prosecutes believers this is the end and you know it is said uh, uh, in other places in the quran that when firon was drowning he said oh now i have iman on the rob of musa and harun so obviously when you are going to see angels with your own eyes everybody is going to have the same iman as abu bakr or allah taala actually the time is now the time is now the test of iman is now when all of that that other paradigm is in the ghaib is hidden and allah subhanahu wa taala has chosen to reveal it to us through the quran right we don't see it with our own eyes do we we don't see it with our own eyes and that is the test of iman and yaqeen those that before we actually see angels with our own eyes that's time to go back and that angel is so allah subhanahu wa taala is with us and our iman is solid inshallah inshallah then allah subhanahu wa taala says in ayah number 104 and then we said to him and the sons of israel settle in the land when the final promise arise we will bring you multitudes of tribes and people all together right the fief are a group of people that belong to different families and they come together right la fifa over here la fifa so what is this over here so there is a hadith of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that towards the end of time isa alaihi salam will return and he will execute the punishment of allah subhanahu wa taala on the bani israel 
that was way overdue. Right? So we have seen in, uh, in the past as well and now as well that there is this mass migration of Israeli, Israelites from around the world to the motherland. Yeah? So the traditional interpretation is that in the Akhirah, he will bring them all back. So don't think that Islam is anti-Semitic, right? All of mankind are qualified recipients of the message of Islam. The people of the Quran, uh, the people that the Quran describes will be killed are people that once again in the face of a messenger disbelieve, right? And another problem with us is what? Uh, if we see over here, right? That non-beneficial thing will be if we constantly talk about, okay, so when is the Islam coming? Are these the signs of the Akhirah? What are you doing, right? So that's another thing that we should understand over here, right? And also, for believers, for us today, Bani Israel is not a bad word. It's a noble word. That means the sons of Abadullah. In Hebrew, Isra means slaves. Ibad and Il, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in addition to this, Israel is the name of a prophet, Yaqub alayhi salam. The prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam did not hate Jews. Right? He did it. You need to understand that as well. This, this rhetoric of hatred, we need to put a stop to. Because the political climate of our time is clouding our religious understanding. And it's important that we do not let that happen, right? So we really, really must look at history, not with rose-colored glasses at all, right? We have to have an understanding of our entire history so we know and we don't make the same mistakes that the Bani Israel made. That is the purpose that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about their Bani Israel in a negative way. Right? Being delusional about your past is one of the biggest mistakes of an Israel. Believing the world is against us, but Allah will help us because we have an awesome past. That's not how it works. That is the way of the Bani Israel. So we need to be very careful when we are talking about and when we are thinking about and when we are relating to Bani Israel. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 105, in truth, we sent it down and in truth, it did come down. And we have not sent you, oh, oh, my beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as anyone but a giver of good news and a giver of warning. Illa mubashiram wa nadira. The commandment was issued that this book will come down with purpose. And the entire delivery will be done purposefully. Even to the Bani Israel, the Quran is telling them, look, you still have a chance. You may recite it for, for the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Everybody has a chance, right? So focus is what? Focus is that this Quran came down. And this Quran created an absolute environment of productivity, of wellness, of health, of shifa, of community, of... Uh, people living the best life in this dunya, inshallah, hoping for the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah says about the Quran again, because these are the last verses of the, uh, of the surah, an incredible Quran. We have distinguished it, made it part by part, and we sent it down over a long period of time, right? We have divided the Quran in portions so that you may recite it to the people gradually. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hikmah that he waited for the right occasion for ayat to be revealed, right? Uh, this, this word over here, mukfin, mukf, this over here, ala mukfin, uh, it also means to wait and recite something slowly, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's messenger will recite slowly and clearly among the people and it will come on the right occasion. A huge mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the Quran is gradual. It didn't come down at once. Little by little, little by little, right? It's not like a storm or thunder. It's like this beneficial rain that comes on us to nourish our souls, to nourish us, right? But that, that is the beauty of the Quran. And sometimes when we learn, and sometimes when we are new to deen and we try to learn the Quran, we try to swallow too much, right? We bite, we, take, we want to take such a big bite that, you know, we won't be able to swallow it. We won't be able to digest it. Little by little, establish yourself on the Quran. 
little by little establish yourself on salah, little by little establish yourself on the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help. And this dua that we do right at the beginning, Rabbi Shrahi Sabri Wallah, open my heart. Imagine that your chest is opening and more of the Quran is pouring in and more of the Quran is pouring in. Yeah? And the maximum benefit of the Quran is when you actually practice. It's not just words to do. Uh, sorry, it's not just words to read. It's words to do. Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us doers of the Quran, inshallah, inshallah, and take the maximum benefit out of it, inshallah. inshallah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 107, tell them, O oh my beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, believe in it or not. Those who were truly given knowledge before, when it is read to them, they fall on their chin. Yani chin uh, indicates like they fall in, in prostration on their faces. They lose control and they fall in prostration. That, that is how, um, that is a kind of emotional attachment they feel with the Quran, right? That, that, that thing that they have, you know, they hear the Quran and their heart skips a beat. Yeah. Rabbis of Bani Israel who had been waiting for this revelation, it passes through their ears and some of them, they just fall in prostration. They can't believe it's happening in their lifetime. People were like that as well, right? So uh, there is a beautiful hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam who talks about crying literally, literally shedding tears of taqwa actually, of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said that the eye that cries with the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with the awe of, actually the, the, the better word is the awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the fire of Jahannam will not touch that face. The fire of Jahannam will not touch that, touch that face. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from among those. Alhamdulillah, Ramadan is just around the corner. We are in uh, the month of uh, in the month of Rajab, right? So we've got very little time before, before you know in Shaban and then inshallah, inshallah, Ramadan. This emotional connect is something that unlocks a sealed heart. This recitation of the Quran, this contemplation on the Quran, that certain ayat that touch your heart so much that you feel it physically on your body. You actually get goosebumps. That is the kind of connection that a true believer has, right? When it is recited to those who were given knowledge before it, they fall down on their faces in prostration. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from among those who engage with the Quran with knowledge, but more with our complete hearts in submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is beautiful, beautiful ayat. Then Allah says in ayah number 108, they say how perfect our master is. He's absolutely perfect. Absolutely the promise of our master has been fulfilled. Who are these people? The ones who approach the Quran with knowledge. The one who cry and fall down in prostration when they hear the Quran. This, this is a book. Uh, this is another thing that they do. That they are like, Subhana Rabbina. Our Lord is just perfection. So one time a group of people came to Abu Bakr and they wanted to hear the Quran. And when they heard the Quran, they started to cry. And Abu Bakr said to them, that's how we used to be till our hearts became hardened. Sometimes you get a little jaded. Uh, sometimes you get so jaded that things don't really affect you. So always pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have a soft heart, to have a porous heart, to have a heart that absorbs. Think of that sponge. And every time you read the Quran or hear the Quran or talk about the Quran, imagine that absorption going inside and inside, pulling you inside, yeah, pulling inside your heart, inshallah, inshallah. Then Allah says in high number 109, Beautiful, beautiful ayat. Uh, they fall down on their faces weeping and it increases humbleness in their hearts. Yeah. They become, you know, khushu is what? One, what a type of khushu is that that you kind of, you just let go of yourself completely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You just fall in front of him with khushu. That is a kind of khushu that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our uh, salah like that, full of khushu, full of humbleness. That, that, that 
inkisari you know that word inkisari where your heart is broken into a million pieces and it gets together with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's remembrance so that is another a sign of iman is that your heart cries your eyes cry when you hear the quran that is a sign, that is a blessed thing that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives somebody a soft heart a heart that cries because what does that mean that means that there is feeling that means that there is emotion that means that there is connection right so when there is no connection nothing is happening your heart is hard how are you going to cry so pray for a soft heart inshallah then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying <clears throat> Qul ud'u Allah aw ud'u Rahman. Call him Allah or call him Rahman, right? Whatever you may call him, know that the exclusive names belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, right? Whichever way you call him, his are the best names, right? And uh, do not be too loud in your salah, nor be too low in it, and seek a way in between. Again, beautiful, beautiful ayats. Beautiful, beautiful ayat. What does this mean? Right? What scholars say, say is that this ayat is a gift of Tawheed. Right? And it has five lessons of Tawheed in it. Tell them, praise and gratitude belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one who didn't take a son, right? And has no partners in his kingdom. He never had any wali and he had to keep... Uh, uh, that he had to keep because of weakness or because of connections, right? So once Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam's habit was that he would uh, roam around at night sometimes to see what's going on. So once he heard uh, Omar radiallahu ta'ala an reciting the Quran very loudly, obviously this was in Tahajjud, right? Um, and then uh, Rasulullah sallallahu wasallam heard uh, uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala an with the... Uh, um, with, uh, who was reciting the Quran in a very low voice. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed these ayat and then he said, even in a moderate voice that you should recite the Quran. Right? Uh, somebody had asked if this is the ayat, ayah of prostration. Yes, uh, it is an ayah of prostration and inshallah ta'ala you can do a sajda after we are finished with our session inshallah. And uh, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying what? وَقُلِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي لَمْ يَتَّخِذْ وَلَدَ وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ شَرِيكٌ فِي الْمُلْكِ وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ وَلِيٌ مِنَّ الْذُلَّةِ وَكَبِّرْهُ تَكْبِيرًا And declare his greatness above all greatness, right? Praise belongs only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We already talked about, uh, uh, did the translation of this before, who has neither had a son, nor is there any partner to him in his kingdoms, nor is anyone needed to protect him from any weakness and proclaim his greatness. Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Kabira. Allahu Akbar Kabira. Allahu Akbar Kabira. You know, another beautiful way to interact with the Quran is that when you when you read certain ayat, right? So respond to that. Respond to that. Uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has told us certain responses to certain ayat, inshallah, inshallah, I will share that with you on your groups. And uh, even if, when Allah is saying, Kabbirhu takbira, you say, Allahu Akbar kabira, Allahu Akbar kabira, right? So this is so beautiful. This ending is tied to the beginning of the surah. It begins with Subhanallah, and it ends with Alhamdulillah. It ends with Alhamdulillah. And the middle is La ilaha illallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no partners in his kingdoms. And you know, that is going to be the state of people who enter Jannah. When they're going to enter Jannah, they're going to be like, Alhamdulillah. That is the, literally the mantra of the believer. Alhamdulillah, in every which situation, right? Praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who brought us here. When they're going to get to Jannah, and they're going to be like, we finally made it, Alhamdulillah, right? Alhamdulillah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the tawfiq to sit and review this beautiful, beautiful surah. Alhamdulillah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the tawfiq to understand words, to understand concepts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us this intelligence to contemplate 
to think, to reflect on these beautiful ayats of the Quran. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to contemplate more and more and more on the Quran and outside of the Quran and on our own selves. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to follow Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sunnah to the best of our ability to the team. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to discover our own shakila and to help others, really our own children and our own students to discover their shakila. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a tawfiq to continue with our weekly sessions, inshallah, inshallah, with iman and with help. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yashikun. Wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Allahumma rabbana ja'alna minhum. Alladheena amanu wa amilu shalihat. Wa tawashaw bil haqqi wa tawashaw bil shabr. Ameen ya rabbil alameen. Ya ghafuru rahim ya arhamu rahimeen. Ya zal jalali wa likram. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. As usual, your feedback or your questions are always welcome. And inshallah, inshallah, from next week, we will start Surah Al Kahf. So then, till next time, inshallah, see you. Assalamu alaikum. Take great care of yourself.